Welcome everybody. My name is David Jones. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Educational Excellence and Innovation here at USQ. And it's my role today to welcome you to the latest of the USQ salons and also to lay some groundwork and some housekeeping, provide some context, and then very quickly hand over to our speaker, Joyce Seitzinger. So before I start, I'd like to provide an acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, the University of Southern Queensland recognises that it is situated on country on which the Jarawa and the Gaibal people have been custodians for many centuries and on which they have performed age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and unique role in their, the life of this region and offer our deep appreciation for their contrib contribution to and support of our academic enterprise. So in terms of the more prosaic housekeeping idea, please make sure your mobile phones are on silent. Um, the restrooms, if you require them, are in the foyer behind us. And that same exit that you've just come through is the only exit that's available if you're in the room and there's some form of emergency. And if there is such a thing, we have to go out to the Northern Engineering Lawn Area, which is to the right. Um, for those of you who are online and uh, Later on, you'll be watching the online recording. So this is being recorded and it is being streamed live at the moment. And at last I heard we had 12 to 15 folk online. Um, and the recording will be posted onto the Salon website afterwards. In terms of questions, we're certainly going to have some questions and I hope Joyce is going to spark a lot of questions that will continue after this session. Um, and also longer term as well. Uh, in terms of the online participants, you can ask your questions in the chat or you can email them to usqsalon at usq.edu.au. You can also engage with us on Twitter using the hashtag usqsalon. Um, studio participants, uh, you'll get to be called upon. I'll deliver the mic for you to use, so please don't ask a question without the mic and Joyce will direct me to the person that she wants to ask her some questions. So a couple of people have asked me why we've got Joyce coming along to talk about learning design, why is learning design and learning experience design in particular very interesting or useful for us at USQ in this context at where we are at the moment. And this is the answer that I will tend to give. It's from Professor Peter Goodyear, a person who has thought, written and researched uh, around teaching and learning in higher education um, in greater quantity and quality than I shall ever do. He knows a lot about what he's talking about. And in this particular Herds of Review, article, he, he, uh, he talks about teaching as design and explains how actually conceptualising teaching as design is actually a, the major way we have at the moment within our grasp as teachers to actually respond to a lot of the pressures and forces that are radically changing what's happening in higher education and making the learning and teaching process actually a lot harder than it used to be when I started 30 years ago. So that's the primary reason that I think learning design, learning experience design can help. But also, even more importantly for folk where I work at the moment, is that I think it's important for universities to find ways by which we can help our teaching staff engage in teach learning design, learning experience design, because we need to help them get into that realm as well. Because in the end, that's how we're going to provide better experiences for our students. And I hope Joyce is going to help us answer a lot of those questions and give us some advice on that. Um, so in terms of introducing Joyce, um, I've known Joyce for almost 10 years. I, I checked last night, Joyce, you were the 69th person I followed on Twitter. <laughs> uh, Nona, who isn't here, was the first. So um, that, that, to me, that says about two, late 2007, early 2008. Um, th at that stage, we were a group of Australasian ed tech folk who were getting onto this unique, funny thing called social media and Twitter and blogs and... I think we engage a lot via blogs. I think I probably came to you via Mark, who I knew first on, on, on there. Since then, uh, I've seen Joyce blossom and do all sorts of interesting things. And I didn't bring my prop along. In 2012, when I started here at USQ, not long after I started, we got it mailed out. Everybody in our, our, our pigeonholes got a physical thing, the Moodle tool guide, um, which was one of the things that Joyce developed in what, 2008, 2007? 10. 2010, yeah. is that late as that? Yeah. Since then, Joyce has gone on to do a lot of things. She's worked in open badges, uh, done some interesting stuff around that. More recently, over the last few years, she's been working in learning experience design nationally and internationally. And in fact, she was telling me this morning, your current job position at RMIT is learning experience architect. So I'm hoping Joyce is going to bring a lot of practical and international experience and insights into the idea of leading the design of learning experiences. Joyce. <laughs> yeah, and that. 
Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, David, for that lovely introduction. And what's even more exciting is that um, we actually get to hang out each other with each other, not on Twitter and not in like stolen moments at various conferences, but we actually have two days. Um, so thank you for inviting me and thank you for organizing everything. And thank you for all the people who've already been so um, hospitable this morning. Um, ooh, now this one's not working. Ah, there we go. Okay, so I'll be talking about leading the design of learning experiences, and um, um, and that's really kind of from a very practitioner-based um, experience. So um, by my accent, you probably assume that I'm American or possibly Canadian. I'm actually Dutch, which is where my learning design uh, career started. And I have been a learning designer uh, for the best part of about 20 years. Now, the things that I'm going to share with you today are not things that um, I've developed in isolation. Um, my journey in from being a learning designer into being a learning experience designer it has been influenced by lots of different people and uh, conversations. And uh, most recently, I was um, at a conference where a lot of people started to put acknowledgments of you know, the people who influenced them um, into, their, uh, into their presentation. And I thought, this is a really nice idea. And so I decided to iterate on that idea, which is part of experience design. And I've, uh, I've um, actually incorporated it here. So here are just some of the people who've been influencing my idea around the use of uh, user experience design and also service design in learning design. And so I'd like to share with you a little bit of the journey of how I got here. And I know it's a little bit trite to start with a biographical intro. Uh, but the reason that I thought I would is because USQ actually features very prominently in my story um, because um, I am an alumni of USQ. I did the Master of Education Technology, which I started in 2004 uh, when I was living in the Netherlands and working in the Netherlands as a corporate learning designer. And uh, at that point, I had a very strong wish to want to move to New Zealand. And so uh, in order to get to New Zealand, not as easy as everyone thinks, there's a big immigration points system. And so I needed to actually upskill and, uh, and have a higher qualification than I did. So um, I looked around and one of the best online um, uh, education experiences in online education came highly recommended and it was through USQ. I'd never been to Australia. I'd never even heard of USQ until I, <laughs> I started to look around and yet there it was and it was also affordable and within my means. So, um, so I signed up uh, in 2004 and uh, had an absolutely wonderful experience and my learning experience at USQ from uh, 2004 until 2008 when I finished my coursework and then my graduation in 2009 uh, was absolutely wonderful and an example to me, uh, one that I use all the time when I want to demonstrate to people that it is possible to build real life connections with people through doing an online degree. There are people that I meet all the time and that I work with in industry who I met through my degree at USQ. Um, there, it is totally possible to build online learning communities. We had a very strong community despite the fact that people were all over the world and connecting with each other. Um, and it is also possible to build a real connection with your teachers via an online degree. Um, Peter Albion, who I've since met, in, since I've moved down under, who I've met at various places, Shirley Russell and Peter Evans continue to be mentors to me and continue to be great um, colleagues now. So, um, so USQ is a very important part of, of shaping the way that I thought about the possibility of online experiences. So I, I started in the Netherlands corporate training, did, got some way towards my degree in USQ, and then I moved to uh, New Zealand as in part because I started to, you know, have extra experience and be able to actually show that I had what it took to, to move into this um, into this uh, new space and move into education. So when I moved to New Zealand, I started to work at a polytechnic uh, in, uh, in New Zealand in the Hawke's Bay. Uh, I was there for five years as their... Um, e-learning advisor and then after that I moved to Australia where I worked at Deakin University for two years so that was 2011 to 2013 and at that point I started to get quite disillusioned uh, with e-learning because I felt that the kind of digital experiences that we were building 
we're starting to be quite repetitive. When I started in the Netherlands working on WebCT, uh, a lot of the work that I did was helping teachers actually move some of their materials online. And that was in 1999. And so 14 years later, in 2013, I start at a new institution, and yet a lot of my work is still helping people move their materials online. And I was like, there's got to be better things. And at the same time, you know, I live, I now live in Melbourne. Uh, you know, there's all these startups and meetups and people are doing exciting things and building exciting digital products. I'm like, this is very frustrating. And I, at one point, and so that's nothing to do with Deakin because this was happening, you know, at every single institution that you would go to. Uh, but I just felt like, God, there's got to be more. Because I think in a way, as learning designers, and I'm someone who's always worked in e-learning, we are designing digital experiences, and that's what we've been doing, we just haven't been calling them that. And so what I started to do in my uh, kind of like my, 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 my gripes and my irritation is I started to go to meetups and I uh, started to volunteer at meetups as well because I was just looking for any other opportunity, not necessarily to, you know, actually thinking maybe education had had its time, I'd had my time there, maybe it was time for me to move on. And so I started to go to things like Startup Victoria and other types of meetups. And I, uh, I also wanted to kind of get connect with people in that community. So I started to uh, volunteer and say, look, I'll run your Twitter account for the for the event that you're running, or I will um, I will come along and help you get people signed in at the door, etc. Because I just wanted to meet new people and kind of explore new opportunities that there would be for me. And so one of the things that I did uh, was I joined a hackathon. Uh, you know, you start on a Friday night, everybody pitches their ideas, and then you've got a full weekend to actually work on developing some kind of product. And during this hackathon, we actually designed a product that was going to match an academic with a possible publishing. Um, uh, opportunity. I thought that maybe there would be something in actually matching an academic with a good idea for, you know, a journal that they could publish in. Um, never went into production, but over that, um, you know, kind of 60 hours that we worked together with that team, there were two things that really happened for me. One was that I was astounded at just how much work we could get through with this tiny team. So there was myself and um, as kind of like the hustler. Uh, but we had two front end developers who were actually building things for us and we had a, um, a, a designer who would actually work with us to kind of show the product and kind of show its development. And, uh, and so the other thing that happened was that I actually got exposed to these magical creatures called user experience designers or UX designers. And these are people who are all about making sure that a product is actually going to meet your user needs. And, uh, and I was really engaged with what they were doing, but I was also really engaged with how they were doing it and the kind of methods and approaches that they were using in order to, you know, kind of collect the ideas from the team, uh, show it back to us, play it back to us, get us to the next iteration, uh, show us how our, t how our ideas had actually changed, and also just like keep on moving us forward. And uh, what I've since realized is that UX is basically just like a subset of human-centered design. The idea that what you want to design is actually going to be fit for the humans that you're designing it for. And so you've got user experience designers, and since then I've also uh, uh, kind of become familiar with service designers. And service designers are not just about designing services. That's not the distinction between those two. User experience designers usually focus on products and making the product better, whereas service designers tend to look at how your entire organization can improve all of the services and all of the products that it offers in order to improve uh, the experience of the users that you're trying to serve. So it's not just the difference between products and services. It's actually about how your organization can respond to your user needs. And, uh, and so I was fascinated with this, and it actually kind of relit my fire about e-learning and learning design. And, um, and I thought, I need to find out more about this, but <laughs> I've left the university, so I'm now unemployed, and, uh, and I haven't got a lot of money, so I, ha I can't go and do a Master of Design Futures. And um, I haven't got... Um, uh, you know, the time either. I need to be earning a living. And so what I started to do is I started to actually barter my skills. And uh, so this was a friend of mine, Bernard Schockmann, who uh, is a UX specialist. And he was looking at starting to develop some training in UX. And it was going to be a three-day, like, boot camp workshop. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, you're running this for the first time. 
I learn UX from you and I will give you feedback on the learning design of your workshop. And so um, through that kind of bartering, I actually ended up getting, uh, getting a few more gigs and, and having the ability to kind of work with people on various products. Uh, and the reason that I wanted to do this was because I just realized that the kind of experiences that we build now with learning design or the kind of experiences that we're being asked to design are really complex and they have lots and lots of different moving parts. So um, if you look here, we've got digital platforms, uh, various digital platforms that we have to coordinate with each other when we try to deliver courses or online learning experiences. Uh, we have digital products that we have to fit in, into that, uh, any type of resources that either you create or that you cre get from a repository. We have digital services that we offer our students. We have digital support that we offer. And then of course, there's also face-to-face -face events and interactions and all of those things, we see them as quite separate but to the student, they're kind of like just this big mass of things and all of them go together to build their learning experience. Uh, and it gets quite complex. So this is a, so people are tr try different ways of actually visualizing some of those. Um, uh, as an example, this is a, a, a course overview from a friend of mine called Whitney Kilgore, who works in the United States. And she designed a MOOC called the Human MOOC, which if you have the time to uh, participate in it, I really, uh, I really endorse. Um, but basically she looked at, you know, well, here are all of the things that we're trying to do within the LMS. And yet there's this exoskeletal that we're trying to design for that actually sits out Inside the LMS and that wraps around all of the things that are happening inside the LMS. Um, and so you can see kind of some of the complexity that involves there. And if you're looking at like corporate training, one of the really popular um, frameworks there is the 70-20-10 model, uh, which Charles Jennings uh, coined. And, um, and again, you can see how it isn't just like only formal learning. It's when you also start to do all of this informal learning around it and other types of learning events. How do you design for that? And how do you make sure that all of those things are actually aligned? And really, what I see the role as of the learning experience designer then being is to orchestrate the elements for the opportunity of experience. And I'll come back to the idea that you can't actually design an experience later on. Uh, but basically, we have all of these disparate elements, and it's up to us to see how we're actually going to orchestrate those. I just realized I keep touching my microphone. I shouldn't. Um, and, uh, and so you, you can start to kind of, and, and so my idea is like, well, what can we borrow from designers who are already there uh, and who've already been designing digital experience and what types of methods and approaches can we actually start to fold in to the work that we do? Uh, and it starts with one of the, you know, best known designers possibly, which is uh, Charles Eames. The design is a plan for arranging elements in such a way as best to accomplish a particular purpose. And that's kind of what we're charged with. And uh, I'm not the only one who's been moving in this direction. Um, this need for, des for more purposeful design in education uh, uh, has been called for by different people. So you mentioned uh, Peter Goodyear already. Uh, his paper in Media Res is one that I go back to all the time in which he really lays out the case for purposeful uh, design in teaching and learning. And he says, teaching in higher education needs to find ways of investing more heavily in that planning phase. And it needs to take on more the qualities of design for learning. Um, Eileen Scanlon, who's in Scotland, has, uh, I think this was a paper from 2013, uh, has called for this idea of developing a set of principled working practices and contributing and starting to build a design science for education. Um, and uh, Liz Sanders, who is in, I want to say Ohio, uh, she's been doing quite a lot of work around this idea of experience design. And she says this has emerged recently as a new discipline. Again, all of these seem to be just subsets of human-centered design. Uh, but they can sometimes give you a different lens from which to, pr uh, to approach your project. Uh, in which she says, though, you know, she, she argues for the idea that there is no such thing as experience design. And that's because an experience always happens inside of someone, right? But what we can do is arrange all of those elements in such a way that the opportunity for experience appears. And so we can design for experiencing. Um, 
And there are some people who've been calling themselves learning experience designer longer than I have. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting one of them online and actually organizing a panel at South by Southwest EDU with her, uh, which was fascinating. Um, uh, and uh, her name's Myra Traven. And a few years ago in a book by Tony Bates, she uh, developed this model about how you could possibly design when you have to combine the learning processes with the technology processes. And she designed this model uh, which I've loved and used in the past when I've, when I've been on course design projects. But as I started to move into this experience um, uh, world, I started to think, actually, it's not so much the technology that is the thing, because it isn't always just technology that we add uh, into our learning design. And it's actually more a case of having the learning on one side that we need to design for, and we're really good at that. We know how to do that. Um, you know, constructive alignment, all of those things, we're quite good at, at, at getting that process set. But then going through the other side of the loop and uh, thinking about the experience, how do we design that experience? And so kind of iterated on our model and, and come up with this idea of a learning experience uh, development process. And so if I, if I look at that model, then I know that, you know, I'm quite strong on the learning design side because I've done that for a long time and I know how to do that piece of work. But on the experience side, I didn't have a lot of things in my toolkit other than maybe the Moodle tool guide, <laughs> which was, I suppose, you know, a, a little artifact I created before I was doing this kind of work. And so uh, I started to become more purposeful about trying to find methods that I could fold into my work. And, uh, and so I'd like to share with you some of the things that I've started to do in order to shift my process. So one of the first things that I'm now much better at is I actually design the design process. I think about how I'm going to get a design team, but even when I'm just a design team of one, I get more purposeful about the process that I'm going to follow and actually sticking with it. Um, and, uh, and I've ab adopted a pretty common design uh, framework called the double diamond, which was coined by the Design Council in the UK and, um, uh, and adapted it for our environment. And so uh, the idea is that you've caught uh, like two processes of converging and diverging um, activities that you undertake. And so uh, if you look at the first double diamond there, uh, the first phase that you want to do as you take on like, uh, or that I like to do as I take on a course design process is to go on a discovery. And, and that's the um, divergent process where I really try to find out as much as I can about the course that I'm going to be working on. So I do market research, I do a competitor analysis, I find out what happened the last few times that the course ran. Um, uh, I look at you know all of the tools that are available in that area and also look at some of the marketing and library and all of the work that people have done around this course. And, and, and if you're working with a design team, then everybody on that design team can inform that discovery. And the idea is not to jump to conclusions, and this is one of the things that Peter, uh, two solutions, and this is one of the things that Peter Goodyear emphasizes as well in that paper that I mentioned, which is the idea that you don't want to, and this is something that learning designers always like to do because we, we think we know how to fix a problem, right? So you, you're in that discovery process, you're like, oh, you know, there's not a lot of communication in this course. We've got voice thread. We can just add voice thread and then we're good. And so you tend to kind of go from that first, iter uh, first part of the process straight to the solution. This is about kind of slowing all of that down and really doing all of your discovery first and then starting to kind of converge and try to pinpoint maybe three to five opportunities for improvement in that course. Because the idea is that we always want to build like the silver bullet of a course and you're, and you're not going to, but what you want to do is actually, you know, this process would get you to the point where you've got about three to five opportunities for improvement in that course. And then you choose the one that you're actually going to work on. You select it and then you start, you know, that divergent process again. You uh, begin developing possible solutions. You start looking at things, you uh, start maybe testing some things, maybe building some things, exploring with tools. Uh, and once you've got a prototype that you're quite happy that you work with, you kind of start that process again of coming to a point and reaching a final solution. And um, what I like to do as I, when I do work with a design team, but this is good practice even if you're just working by yourself, um, is to actually kind of design that work and not always use the same methods because 
different projects are going to require you to use different methods. And so when I'm designing with the team, uh, it's a good idea to actually uh, like put up like the double diamond on a wall and just list with your team like what you need to find out and what method you're going to use to find to find that out. So if you're in the discovery phase, you say, all right, you know, we're going to do a competitor analysis. How much do we know about after that? Okay, what is another method that we can use in this discovery phase to find out the next bit that we need to find out? And um, if you haven't got, and as I didn't when I started to do all this work, if you haven't got like that huge toolkit of methods to draw from, then uh, there are some really good resources around. And this is one of my favorite books for that. It's called Game Storming. Uh, it's by Dave Gray. And, um, the, uh, and it's just full of all of these types of activities that you can run as part of a design team. To, uh, to, to get your team across the line. And it kind of relates to, it, to the purpose for that method. Why would you do this? Is it because you need to do some discovery? Is it because you actually need to get the whole team on board? And it's got different activities for different purposes. One of the other things that I've started to do is to uh, read widely in, uh, in UX. And this is currently one of my favorite books. It's called User Story Mapping. It's by uh, a New Zealander called Jeff Patton. And he talks about this idea that shared document, the takeaway quote for me from that book so far, is the sh that shared documents are not shared understanding. So quite often when we design a course, we've got all the learning outcomes, we've got the course guide written up, and we're like, well, if we've got that, then we know exactly how this course is going to run. And, um, and of course, that's not true because shared documents are not shared understanding. And the idea is of actually working together with other people in order to have that evocative experience that uh, gets you all to be on the same page and to have really articulated your ideas. And I went through this with someone last week, ended up having a one and a half hour conversation that I just could not leave because I knew that we didn't have a shared understanding. And we couldn't get there without you know, sketching our ideas, you know, ripping out a page in the notebook saying, no, let's, let's go back to this because I'm pretty sure we're still not on the same page. And so what you want to do is you want to really dig into things and not let things go if you have the feeling that there isn't shared understanding. As the designer, you're actually quite often not the designer. You're quite often actually the facilitator of the design process. And so you become the guardian of the shared understanding. If you feel like there is a disconnect within your design team, or if you feel that like there's a disconnect between you know, a particular course design and the program design, then your job as the designer of that experience is to articulate that and make sure that everyone is on the same page. So you become the guardian of the shared understanding. And uh, what I really like about um, the way that Jeff uh, kind of articulates this is this idea that when we start to externalize our ideas and we actually make them visible, whether it's through post-its or through sketches, and then we start moving those things around, the cool thing about that is that what we're actually doing is we're moving our joint ideas around. So you can't see or touch shared understanding, but usually you can feel it. You can feel it when you've finally gotten there. Uh, the other thing that I like to do in terms of designing the design process is to actually kind of time box it and not draw it out over an entire semester or even just a few weeks, uh, but to try to clear space in people's calendar. And this often means that you have to get in really, really early but to get people together and do it in one strong burst. Um, so this is an example from, um, uh, which you may have read, but it's, uh, the, the book is called Sprint. It was written by the guys that started Google Ventures. And uh, it's a very simple framework for uh, all of the things that you need to do in order to complete a five-day sprint. Now, clearing five days in everyone's calendar can be incredibly painful, but it is actually possible to follow this um, I've heard of people who've applied this at Telstra, even with getting some senior management people on board, uh, by taking the disparate activities that you need to take and stretching them out a little bit further. But it's a really good idea to just frame it as a sprint and make sure that everyone knows what the process is and what the product is that you want by the end of that week. And then the other bit that I do in terms of starting to design the design process is bring on board the users. <laughs> so there's a new journal that has just started called Students as Partners. And there's a large conference that was recently held in Canada as well. But this idea of actually bringing in your students as partners to co-design 
uh, what the experience is actually going to look like uh, is increasing. And it's a, it's a great development because this is the only way that you're ever going to uh, improve the experiences if, if you actually start including your stakeholders. Uh, last year we did a project uh, where we looked at seven programs and taking a new uh, a way of doing program innovation. And we kicked it off uh, with uh, doing uh, user research with our students. So we actually did uh, user interviews um, and, um, and designed uh, persona and user stories that we had available for when we did the large en masse co-design workshop. And we also invited the industry stakeholders and students uh, to come to those workshops. And it was incredibly challenging. It was really challenging. People were very worried about what people were gonna say. You know, they're gonna see our dirty laundry. Um, but you know, if you can break through that, then there's actually the opportunity for uh, getting some much more robust ideas for innovation um, because you're facilitating the conversation between all these people and gathering all of their ideas together at the same time, at the moment of genesis, uh, rather than going to industry partners um, after you've already kind of designed what the innovation is going to be and say, do you like it or not? Uh, there's much less opportunity for feedback and for really improvement at that stage than there is at the beginning of that process. And so it really becomes your job as a facilitator of the design process to design those conversations and be quite purposeful about that. And I've designed any number of artifacts to help me do that. Um, and again, steal like an artist, um, you know, I have been borrowing liberally from um, service design, from UX, and from uh, customer experience. So this is an example where I've taken a customer experience tool and I've adapted it to have an LX conversation with people. Uh, uh, talked about it as the LX pyramid, and this idea that what we really want to do is to stop focusing on tasks that we want uh, students to engage in and to lift our, our, our eyes and, and try to get people to start focusing on experiences. And basically this became a tool to actually have the conversation with people. If you look at your course design, where do you think most of the elements in that sit? Are they sitting at the functional level? Are they sitting at the reliable level? Or do do you manage to cross over the convenient line, which is quite often very hard to get across? Um, and do you even get like to the top level anywhere? And again, not trying to design a silver bullet, but you can always say, well, the way that we do the discussion forums really is below par. And so it's just very functional. Yes, students can communicate, but it's not very engaging. It's reliable. Does it get to usable on a mobile? Maybe not so much. Uh, and so you can say, all right, well, let's just fix that problem. Let's fix that problem and see whether we can get that over the convenient line. Um, and there, like I said, there are great models to borrow from. I would love to have find a little bit of time in order to take this elements of value pyramid and start like really digging into that and think, and think about how um, uh, we could apply some of these elements to, um, to the way that we do learning design. This was on the uh, Harvard Business Review, so um, it's out there if you want to find it, the elements of value pyramid. And, uh, and like I said earlier, you know, this is really a way for me to continue to facilitate the conversation. And it's probably something that I was doing with the Moodle tool guide uh, uh, way back in 2010. Now, you will come across some people who have terrible affliction. They are allergic to butcher's paper and <laughs> post-its <laughs> and uh, basically walk into a room and just go, oh, post-its. And uh, that's something that you're gonna have to contend with. Uh, the best thing that you can do is really to give them an immediate experience of, uh, of how this can actually become that idea of sharing ideas. It's not just about getting the post-its up. This is about all of us articulating our ideas and then combining them together. Uh, one of the other methods that we used in order to do all of our user research was observation. Uh, had a project last year where um, people were worried about a program site that they were using and um, it was all disorganized and basically our job was, can you come in and make it prettier, please? And we were like, well, 
maybe we should do some user research first. And as we did all of the user research, what we, what we discovered was actually not so much that there was a problem with the aesthetics of the course or even the organization of the course, there were actually some other problems with that course. One of the things that we got all the people that we interviewed, so this was staff and students, that we got them all to do was just show us around. Uh, but we also got them to sketch out what their desired state would do. And even though you know this was difficult to achieve in the learning management system, as we got them to sketch it out, all of a sudden they were telling us a lot more than when they were just showing us around the site. So we asked them, show us the site and what's the problem? And well, you know, like it would be great if I could have an extra button here. But we gave them this blank canvas with just like a framework on it. We said, all right, well, what would you like? And they're like, oh, well, I want students to see the events and I want them to have their assessment right there and I want it to be dynamic. And all of a sudden there was a lot more articulation. So these are the types of kind of artifacts you can bring into your conversations. Uh, we did some card sorting where we, we actually took all of those elements in that site printed them out and said, well, how would you organize these? And what came out of that was actually that the problem wasn't so much the aesthetics, it was more that people were using um, different uh, labels and titles for different things, and that there wasn't a common understanding about how to talk about the assignments. And so it was much more a problem of language and getting everyone across a common framework for describing things, then there was a problem with the actual organization of the course. So we could have organized it differently and you would have still had that problem. So what you really want to do is think about every design conversation that you have the opportunity to have. Even if you're a solo designer, you're gonna go and talk to like a librarian, you're gonna go and talk to a colleague. Um, you know, always make sure that you have a design for that conversation, that you're quite clear about what the outcome should be because you want to have respect for your design partners and you want to respect their time. And it just makes everyone uh, work together a lot better. You want to also have this empathy for your design partners, right? Um, and this is a quote from one of my favorite um, uh, authors and UX uh, researchers. She recently spoke at our LX conference, which we ran a few months ago. Uh, and uh, it was mind boggling and they'll soon come out on the podcast. So um, I'll be really glad when we, when we can actually start sharing that. But um, she wrote a book called Practical Empathy in which uh, she talks about empathy as a noun and a thing. And it's an understanding that you need to develop about another person uh, before you can actually start putting that into action. So then it's also your job as the facilitator and the guardian of understanding to make sure that you capture any conversations. Um, I've had really good, uh, I always give a plug to the PO recorder uh, because it is just so easy and what it lets you do is it just sits there on your iPhone and you can just quickly double tap it when somebody says something interesting. So even if you're not doing any kind of UX research, like for any kind of other research that you're doing, it's a great little interview tool. And um, I also like to kind of capture the moment at which shared understanding happens. And it's quite often during these workshops. Now, if I showed any of you, you know, this picture, you, and even if you could read the post-its, it wouldn't necessarily say to you like what happened there and, and, and you wouldn't immediately be able to understand it. But anyone who was actually at that workshop that we did will immediately know what the shared understanding was. It is the shape of that um, that actually kind of becomes like, or elicits like an evocative reaction in people that helps them trigger the memory of the understanding that was reached. And so it's always really good practice after you have these conversation uh, or design events to make sure that you capture everything that was in the room and that you play it back to everyone. And, uh, and then usually there's a little bit of um, quite hard work in terms of also synthesizing those findings. Um, like things like coding the conversations and then theming them all up and then getting them back to each other, uh, uh, getting them back to your team and even going a little bit further and starting to develop some persona because the thing is not everyone can always be in, uh, can be part of the entire uh, uh, user research process and so you need to find a way to actually start playing it back to the people who weren't there so that they can test their ideas for innovation uh, in your project. And so one of the things that uh, we've started to do is uh, persona and I know we're gonna talk to um, uh, Adrian and his team 
about persona later on. Uh, persona is one way. There's another, there's a little bit of controversy in UX world. Uh, some people like the persona um, artifact. Other people talk about it in terms of jobs to be done. So if you're not taken with the idea of creating like these um, archetypes of your users, then the jobs to be done model uh, might be something that you want to look at. Um, and another thing that uh, I started to do, this is actually one that we did for the Learning Experience Conference, uh, was to build a mental model of what our users are going to be doing and then mapping out what we as an organization were going to put in place in order to, um, to respond to that. And so this becomes a visual of uh, all of the things that you need to do. And they might be things that you're not in charge of, but that you still need to make sure that somebody else actually puts in place. And then you want to design, and that kind of gets you on the, on the way to journey mapping, which I think is one of the most powerful tools in either service design or, uh, or user experience design. Uh, it's the idea of really complicating, the, 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 or of, of really describing the very complex uh, webs that we weave uh, when we design the learning experiences that we do. And again, also articulating even those parts that maybe you and your colleagues don't necessarily control, but you need to become aware of them. Um, I, um, I have an anecdote from back in 2007 when uh, we, were we had designed these beautiful Moodle courses and we were wondering why people weren't uh, coming into our Moodle courses and using them. And, um, and I didn't find out until several months into the, pro uh, to the project where, uh, where I happened to come across the kind of standard letter that students were issued uh, from IT uh, that had their login details. And just the layout of that letter was, in and the wording of that letter was incredibly confusing. And so like there was our clue, right? It, there was, this was the reason that people weren't going into our courses. Um, but it hadn't been part of my pro project to map out th that front end of the entire learning experiences. And so I, I didn't know about it and I couldn't influence it. So doing the work of journey mapping actually helps you to start to align all of those different elements and all of the things that you need to put in place. Um, this is an example from a graduate project actually called Keeping Graduates Green and it's all about a sustainability uh, service on campus. Uh, but what you see is that the, um, the yellow bar there is the uh, user journey and all of the steps that the user takes. And then um, this is actually a, a service design blueprint. And so it breaks things down then into front stage and backstage. Front stage are all of the things that your user would see. So in our case, our student, you know, all of the front facing things and the backstage are the things that still need to happen, but that the student might not be aware of is, hap is actually happening. Um, and then it also forces you to actually articulate every single artifact that you need to create in order uh, for that process to work. So it's a very, uh, it seems very simple, but you know, if you're doing a service design blueprint really well, it could span an entire room. And uh, so we, we did our attempt, but at a very small level. Um, uh, and, and it doesn't have to be big always, uh, but we did an initial three hour mapping session then continue to work on it by putting it into Google. And so this, again, this is your job as the facilitator, it's to make sure that it all becomes digitally um, uh, available to your entire team. And then we work together with our graphic designer to actually create a final learning map, uh, a learner journey map. And it, that doing the process of that map actually helped us to uh, find out where the blockages were and where we could make some improvements. And we'll share the slides with everyone um, so that people can uh, look at that. But some of the pain points that we found were actually not on the student end, it was actually with the teacher end who was just being completely inundated with emails and trying to run this work experience project and uh, some simple tools would sol solve her problems. So you really want to prompt different ways of thinking and some of the ways that you can do that is by forcing people to use methods that wouldn't normally be in their comfort zone. So um, I like to get people to sketch. So if you're coming to the workshop tomorrow, you can be prepared for that. <laughs> and uh, I also like to put time limits on things so that people don't go overthink it and get really defensive about their ideas. Uh, but both of those things can really help you to kind of like break through a difficult point in the conversation. 
Uh, and I love the idea of sacrificial ideas, of just getting people to just generate ideas and not get too attached to them yet. And so one of the things that we'll be doing tomorrow as well is just like generating a whole bunch of ideas, but then getting the whole group to prioritize which ones they think are valuable and which ones they want to work on. And then create artifacts for support. What can you do in order to actually visualize uh, where the design is at and, um, and play it back to the team? And validating the ideas. You know, once the ideas are there, uh, put a little bit of business sense around it. So we like to use a lean cam canvas to actually test those ideas and, uh, and, and display them to other people and do some user testing. Um, through paper prototyping and not getting too invested in building out an entire digital solution before you actually know that it's going to appeal. So, and I have found that this is absolutely true. Getting a prototype in front of people just breaks through a lot of barriers and immediately shows it where you could have gone round and round in a conversation for several meetings. So um, one warning, um, if you become a learning experience designer, for me, it has come with a card addiction. There are many, many card decks out there that can help you do some of the design. And um, so, uh, so you might get drawn into that particular rabbit hole as I have. Uh, this is one that's freely available from JISC. They designed this ages ago. It's called the Design Studio, and it's a way of uh, doing uh, either program or uh, course design. Uh, Grania Canole was involved uh, in, in developing that, and you can download it and uh, even adjust it for your own purposes. And I've started to develop one as well because I just love cards so much. So I've started to develop one that I can use in workshops that I run. And you really want to hone your facilitation skills. I was really lucky way back when in, in the Netherlands, I, uh, I was able to do corporate training and become a facilitator. They sent me on a three-day facilitation course at a convent in Brussels. <laughs> and uh, and I never really used it or I didn't think that I had. And then all of a sudden, you know, like 20 years later, here I am. And uh, suddenly my facilitation skills are, are paying off again. Um, if, you, uh, if you're a little bit worried or you just want like a new injection on your existing facilitation skills, go to meetups, go to hackathons, see how other people do it. I went through some things at General Assembly in Melbourne and just you know, service design thinking, UX 101. And it's just great to kind of refresh your skills, see what, how other people are running their sessions. Um, you can also bring in, an, if you've got a little bit of budget, bring in an outside facilitator to co-design with. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we had a few service designers that we were working with from Make Studios, and it was just amazing to watch them work. Uh, always in the service of the entire design team. It was really impressive. Um, ask to sit in on other people's sessions, um, and remember that designers do it with others. So we really want to do good design because good design gives us an increased possibility of success. Um, you want to invest in the design because you want better user experiences for your students. And the last line that Mike says here is, if you're not doing it, you can bet that your competitors are. Uh, Mike Montero actually wrote a great book called Design is a job. And so I will leave you all with that idea that we have all become experienced designers. And with that, I'll take your questions. We'll start at the back, because those were my instructions. <laughs> people wow. on the live stream. Uh, so Alice would like to know whether you have a template that helps us capture the student learning journey or if there's an app. Yeah, there are loads of apps. Um, there are apps for the iPad and, um, and there are apps for your iPhone. And there are lots of templates. If you do a search for either journey mapping or for uh, service design toolkits, um, there's, like I said, you know, steal like an artist. You can just find all of this stuff online. Um, uh, I've got some that I use, uh, but you know, I can tweet them out later. Um, the app thing, though, can be quite problematic because um, journey maps can get like and can get so complicated. Um, 
uh, I tried to do one on an iPad, but once you go beyond a few different user activities, it actually starts to become unwieldy. And really the best way, and in order to get the best buy-in, is always to actually just start with a paper version. So find what I like to call a war room, but that's probably not a nice name for it, but find a project room that you can set up and find a dedicated space where you can put up your papers and keep moving things around and have it kind of in your face all the time, because that also allows you the opportunity of actually bringing people into the design process. And uh, really the nice shiny, which we had with our graphic designer, which looks great, at the point that you show that to someone, they, a stakeholder or a user, they feel like the decisions have already been made. They feel like it's a finished product and they can't contribute to it anymore. And so the longer you can keep it like analog and paper-based, the better actually, yeah. Thank you. Uh, first, thank, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, thank you. For, no, no, thank you very much for your overview of uh, the design approaches that that, that you work mm. with and have been part of developing. Uh, lots of it, of course, points back to or is, is part of sort of like the agile discussion mm. and so on. Mm. You've done a really nice job pointing out some techniques and methods. I'm wondering if there are one or two principles that sit underneath your thinking as you're engaging that you could share with us as well. Yeah, I think I think to me it really comes back about that empathy for the user and um, realizing that um, basically in my in most of my career I've been the advocate for the user and, and but never really articulated it that way. And then at the same time I was a poor advocate for the user because I was um, uh, because I usually based my understanding of the user. Um, uh, on very little data, because uh, I would go into a meeting with a subject matter expert and I would say, so how do you usually run this course? You know, Do you think your students will like this? Do you think your students will like that? And so I was kind of getting a vicarious understanding of the users. And so really starting to say, no, the empathy for the user has to come first. And that's kind of been my journey for the last two years, saying, no, I really need to understand who that user is and how they are using our product. I think that really underlies an, uh, underlies a lot of the work that I've been doing and a lot of the shift that's come in my work. And then the other thing is understanding that the user is not necessarily always the learner, but it's actually also the people who are involved in the other aspects of the learning process and saying, yes, you know, the librarians are part of it and uh, the people in student admin are part of the experience and the teacher and the tutor and the markers, everyone is part of that experience and needs to be served through the experience that we actually design. So I would say if there's anything, it would be that empathy for the user. Thank you, Joyce. Um, you touched a little bit on it when you sort of very clearly said that um, the experience sits with, with the person. You can't really design mm. yeah, and enforce that. But what I'm thinking about it in the design experience and, and what I'm coming across is that our there is no the learner. The learners are very complex and multiple and very diverse that come into yeah. our courses. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts on design for flexibility and diversity because our learners are, you know, one size does not fit all. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I think that really starts with being quite clear about the different um, the different types of learners that you might have in your course, and then uh, that brings us to developing, uh, you know, a good understanding and having those different persona and really going back to those all the time, uh, being able to say, well. You know, we have uh, this type of, of person and they uh, are very self-directed and they really like to just get on with the course and so the course has to serve them. But then having this other type of person who really prefers to be like a social connector and that was actually one of the uh, types of people that, of type of persona that we had in the previous uh, uh, project that I did. And uh, these people really need to connect socially before they actually start engaged, uh, start to engage with the learning process. And so starting to find out more about that and making sure that that's clearly articulated to your, enti to your entire design team, then that actually enables you to go back and say, oh, okay, well, we need to add something to the course because at the moment, yes, it's heavily geared to this persona, but it's not actually serving these other people. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Hi, it was excellent. Um, I've got a bit of a broader question, I suppose, just based on the experience. If you, if you think... Uh, the experience in, in general in, in the commercial world, just been thinking about IKEA, right? That's the kind of place you go there, you don't want to buy much, 
but somehow they get you in the right kind of mindset and suddenly you have to check out and you know, $600 worth of things. Like, how far away are we in the education <laughs> space from a user experience like that where they you know, come into the course but somehow we manage to get them on board in the end, you know, they learned a lot and they didn't expect it to learn. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the IKEA model for education, I like yeah. that. Um, well, I would say there are some people who are doing that really well already. Um, so I, I am subscribed to a site called Skillshare. And Skillshare is a subscription site. And uh, it focuses mostly on um, design skills business skills and a lot of craft skills. And they've got these short video-based um, uh, uh, courses that are always accompanied by a project that you work on. Um, but there isn't a lot of feedback within that. It's just self-directed. You just follow the, the lead from the expert who's designed the course and then uh, you do the project or you don't, you know, they don't make you do the project. Um, and, um, I pay a subscription fee for that and you know I browse there uh, but there are months go by where I pay the fee and I don't actually participate but whenever I go there all of a sudden I'm like oh actually yeah I, I would like to do that hand lettering didn't even know what it was five minutes ago but now I totally want to learn what that is so I think there are some people who are moving in that direction um, but um, so there's two questions then. Is that a model that we should be searching for? <laughs> uh, or does it just get too wide and too purposeless? Um, and um, uh, so is it a model that we should be striving for? And if so, and if it is, then, then how do we get there? Yeah, but th I think there's certainly some people who are doing interesting things that we can already see. I think, for instance, the Coursera model of saying like, well, we've got all of these courses, but then, you know, they started to actually bundle them into like little programs to... That, that are bigger and more significant. I think that's that's an interesting idea. Was there a response to that over here? No? Oh, okay. I have one more question, if you don't mind, on the opposite side of the spectrum. Like, how do you bring the academics, the teachers, into the experience model? Because in reality, in, in traditional teaching, a lot of teaching, it's a lot about the academics, all the tools and everything, if you have a engaged academic, you know, students put up with a lot of bad artifacts, bad environment, badly designed learning experience in general. They still have a great learning experience because of a great ex academic, if they have a bad academic or a bad teacher or not, not engaging with students in the right way, you know, that it doesn't matter what else is there. So how do we integrate that in, in, in the process you've been describing? Yeah, it's certainly not easy, and I think it goes to something that's quite fundamental, which is around um, ownership of the course and the perception of ownership of the course. Who owns the course, right? Is it is it the course coordinator? Is it the learning designer? Who you know who owns what that course finally looks at, or is it actually the students that own the course and own the course experience? And at the moment, you know, we might not be serving them uh, the best. But I think. Um, if there is a strong understanding of, of, or if there is a strong course ownership by the course coordinator, it can certainly be challenging to bring them on board and to start engaging uh, in that way. But I think when there is a collaborative possibility and you've built some kind of connection, then it becomes a little bit easier. Um, with the program uh, innovation that we did last year, that was certainly a challenge with some people, you know, really being open to the process and other people not wanting things touched at all. Um, so it's not an easy one. I don't have an easy answer, but I think there's something around that course ownership. And, uh, you know, if it's such a complex experience to design, it's actually going to require different skills sets to design it. And, um, and that means someone needs to let you in so that you become part of it. Yeah, but it's not easy. <laughs> Jasmine, do we have... Catherine, uh, what suggestions do you have for our own development if we live in an even smaller regional town than Toowoomba? <laughs> um, actually, there's some great um, courses online that you can do. Um, there's, a, there's actually a free one uh, that is run through an organisation called Acumen, A-C-U-M-E-N, and uh, they focus on social entrepreneurship, but they uh, developed a course together with um, IDEO, 
and um, they run it like three or four times a year and uh, you can sign up for it. It's a really interesting model because what they get you to do is they get you to actually find a design team before you, uh, before you join the course and so you have to sign up as a team. And the entire course is built around doing team activities and they give you very detailed um, uh, method sheets, et cetera, for running your workshops. And uh, it takes you through all of the different phases that you need to do. And so, um, so Acumen is definitely one. If you're willing to pay, then there are uh, organizations like the Interaction Design Foundation for Interaction Design. And also um, IDEO has actually started its own university, well, university, that they, that they call IDOU. So um, that's, uh, and they do fully online courses, so you can sign up for those as well. There's literally lots of places where you can upskill yourself if you have to do it online, but I really recommend the Acumen model because uh, it's about five to six weeks and it forces you to meet up with your friends and, or your team and actually do something together and one of you becomes responsible as a facilitator so it gets you into good habits as well yeah thank you everybody who's here thank you for those online uh, and lastly can we just express our thanks to joyce once again thank you. Thanks, everyone.